Welcome back to another Let's Play video on Medieval Total War 2. This one is subtitled Agincourt Revisited. The two old enemies are going to be going toe to toe with each other once more. Um, I've jumped on a bit since the end of the last video. That one finished at the end of turn 13. We're now on turn 81. The main things that have happened in the meantime are that France declared war on me which went quite badly for them and as you can see from the map they've lost quite a lot of territory. Um, they're down to uh, the last stronghold being Marseille and one large enemy in the field which uh, this video is going to be mainly about how we defeat that army. Right, as you can see the um, battle is going to take place in the territory of Zaragoza. Uh, my army is slightly larger than the enemy's, um, than the French army. Uh, we have a good mix of some more modern uh, units thrown into our army as well, so we should have the advantage here. However, they do have the advantage of terrain. Uh, they're defending in mountainous territory. Also, there are some um, limitations within the game engine uh, and terrain modelling that mean it's, it's quite difficult sometimes to actually uh, deploy uh, forces properly on very hilly or mountainous terrain, which could cause us some problems. So, I moved to attack them to get the battle started. Uh, the French initially retreat, which I'm not going to say anything further about. Um, the second time round, they can't retreat, so they have to fight. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the uh, numbers are very, very similar. Uh, if I'd have had a spy close by, uh, I could have actually used them to infiltrate the enemy army to get an exact count of all the different units. Um, not too worried about that on this occasion, so uh, yeah, let's get the battle started. So initially what we're trying to do is get all of our troops grouped together in the right formations um, and right from the outset you can see as I'm trying to uh, group up my longbowmen and actually um, set them into a, a single line formation the, the terrain is really causing some problems here, they're, they're scattering all over the place. Uh, you can see as I'm um, grouping up my infantry that I leave two units um, separate from the main group. The reason for that is it's always very useful to have a reserve available. Sometimes I use them just to cover the, the extreme flanks. Sometimes if I'm going to get um, an enemy army likely to spawn behind my position, I'll actually uh, set them up to fight be behind my army facing in the opposite direction. As I click the start battle button, one of the immediately obvious things is that uh, <laughs> the French forces aren't appearing in front of me. Now that's a mistake that I made, I, I because of the terrain was a little bit blindsided um, and actually set up facing in completely the wrong direction and the enemy army are right up on top of the hills behind me. So um, you'll now see me rush to climb the hill and get my troops up there as fast as possible and get the advantage of the higher ground over the French. Now, I immediately uh, send my cavalry off on a scouting mission towards where I think the enemy forces are just to give me a better idea of where they are, how they're set up and how many of them are, are there. Um, so I'm just going to get the rest of my infantry units moving up the hill whilst those cavalry move closer towards the French. In a situation like this where um, I've made a mistake in setting up my troops, it's critical to get the um, or to, to make up for that and get the best position I can in terms of deployment for when the battle actually is joined. So you'll see me moving my troops now and uh, I, I actually speed up the counter whilst I'm waiting for my uh, cavalry to get back from their scouting mission uh, and also for my troops to climb the hill. I'm thinking that uh, <laughs> there may be an enormous amount of grumbling amongst the ranks of my uh, my troops at the idiocy of the general who just set them up facing in completely the opposite direction and now expects them to climb a mountain wearing armour and carrying all of their gear. 
Yeah, not good. As we're looking at this piece of terrain, you can see there's a, a, a small notch in the uh, almost in the cliff face, which is pretty much the only route we've got to actually climb up there. So uh, I'll shortly be giving my troops the uh, uh, order to uh, get up that that gap. Um, they're incredibly dangerous, those choke, choke points. If you ever manage to catch an enemy army in a position where it's trying to come up a choke point like that, particularly if you've got a good array of uh, ranged weaponry, you can absolutely massacre them before they even get in melee range of your infantry. One of the obvious things on the replay that we're watching now is um, that my cavalry have blundered into the enemy infantry. Now, I didn't notice that when I was actually playing it, so I ended up taking quite a few casualties in my cavalry before I um, actually withdrew them. One of the reasons for being so keen on getting uh, the, the higher elevation than the, the enemy force is that that higher elevation means that my missile um, troops have further range uh, and conversely that the enemy's missile troops have a shorter range so they've got to come a cl lot closer to me to actually hit me and uh, I could be picking them off from a much further distance. This is particularly important when you come up against an enemy that's got a large amount of uh, ranged troops as well. Um, crossbows are very popular with uh, the, the Central European countries um, and they will just swamp you with missile fire and take down your uh, infantry and your missile troops uh, before the melee battle is even joined. This particular part of the terrain uh, looks suitable to have uh, the battle on. I can pretty much stretch out my forces and, and set them up as I need to. There's also, if you look where I'm hovering the mouse, there's an area where it's uh, basically un unavailable, you can't get to it, which means it will give me a natural barrier to stop them trying to flank me. So you'll see now I try and set up my main force um, parallel to the um, enemy force, and then I'll try and send up my, uh, my reserve force to um, just really cover the left flank and actually extend that line out towards that terrain feature which means that there's no way I'm going to get flanked. You can see as uh, the remainder of my longbowmen get into position that they've already started taking a few casualties from the enemy's crossbow troops um, and then as my longbows actually get into their right position you'll see them starting to open fire. Now that will very quickly whittle down the enemy's um, Missile troops, I've just left it on fire at will. That seems to prioritise missile troops over anything else. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to let them do their thing whilst the rest of the troops get into position. You can see I would check in to see whether the enemy general was in range of my longbow troops. Um, one of the best and quickest ways to win is actually take out the enemy general. Uh, that then really has a negative impact on the morale of his troops. So if you combine that with some cavalry charges to the rear of what's left, then you can very, very quickly win the, the, the battle and even turn around a situation where it looks like you're obviously going to lose. The flip side of that is also true, of course. Uh, if the enemy takes out your general, it's going to make it a lot harder to win and a lot easier for the AI to beat you. Um, this is particularly difficult when you get a bit later on in the game and come up against some of the uh, larger siege engines like trebuchets, cannons, etc. As they can quite often hit your enemy general without you even realising he's in range. And I have had situations where almost within the first shots they've fired they've hit my general and killed him. Which is pretty annoying if it's uh, a character that you've spent a long time developing and building up with lots of different positive traits. I've just sent my general into uh, an attack against the enemy's archers. If you look, they're quite spread out and very vulnerable to a, a cavalry charge. Um, if it, he does a good job of it, he can actually probably take out at least a couple of units of uh, peasant archers there. Um, also, I can notice that the enemy's general is now within range of my longbows, so I've targeted him. Which means that my general isn't then going to get peppered by arrows from his own troops.
The AI has reacted to the charge by my general um, by rushing towards him with a lot of his infantry. So that's probably about the right time for me to withdraw my general back to safety and let the, uh, the rest of the troops do the work now. Our men are winning the battle. If we continue like this, we will smash the enemy. Now that the enemy forces are moving into the kill zone, I've given my cavalry the instruction to move up a bit closer and more behind their troops. Um, this gives me the opportunity to carry out a very quick cavalry charge into the rear of them if need be to take advantage of, um, of them being low on morale. Or uh, actually when they start to rout it just puts them in a better position to pursue them and capture prisoners. Now that the melee battle has been joined, you can see that I'm uh, basically moving the mouse around trying to identify where their highest threat um, troops are. The sergeant spearmen are significantly stronger than any of the militia or peasants that the, the enemy army are fielding. So I'm trying to find a way of actually reducing them. Also, their general has charged straight into my line of infantry, so if I can find a way of actually attacking him from the flanks or the rear, that you'll see me trying to do that. As I'm directing my infantry to attack these enemy units, you can see that I'm using waypoints by using the shift key as I'm clicking. This enables the unit to move properly out behind the enemy unit and then attack and charge into the rear or flank. If you don't do that, what actually happens is the units tend to just pivot in place and will just walk towards the enemy then, which in all likelihood means that they'll uh, basically just join the ongoing melee from the frontal aspect, um, which doesn't give you any bonuses for charging the flank or rear. men have slain the enemy general. Without him, his troops will lose their will to fight. The urge to launch into Another One Bites the Dust by Queen was very strong, but luckily for your ears, um, I'm more considerate than that. The death of the enemy general has had an almost immediate effect on the morale of all of the troops in the fight now. If you look, more and more of them are starting to rout. Uh, and very quickly this is going to just change into uh, not so much a battle and just me pursuing the, the routing survivors to collect up as many survivors as we can get and keep them a prisoner. Again, either for ransom or um, if we're feeling nice we can release them, but uh, I need the money and France deserve to pay. I'm going to send off uh, any of my cavalry units and the general after the enemy routing troops. Um, what I tend to do is try and get the highest value troops first, so that the more advanced troops, because if France does pay a ransom, they'll pay a higher ransom for, for example, feudal sergeants than they will for peasants. Uh, sucks to be a peasant. One of the more irritating features um, of this stage of the battle is that quite often your cavalry will get into a, a kind of bizarre situation where it's actually just following along behind an enemy unit and not really gaining on it. Um, also some terrain features like small rocks will cause your cavalry to have an enormous amount of trouble getting around them for some reason, it slows them down hugely. They also tend to go for a tail pursuit rather than actually, if you try and intercept the, the, the first, you know, the front of the routing unit, they'll actually just 
go round behind it and then do a tail chase. So quite often it's worth keeping an eye on your cavalry units as they chase these routing units, just to make sure that they do keep um, catching up with the units you've sent them after. All of Christendom will be awed by the victory we have won here today. And that's it, the end of the battle. And uh, pretty much a rerun of Agincourt again, looking at the casualty stats, almost 10 to 1 losses um, in our advantage. Uh, so, yeah, despite a <laughs> bit of a bad start caused by my own stupidity, uh, managed to pull it back. So, yeah, that's a good result. France has the floor in, sire. We... Sadly for our prisoners, and mostly for our coffers, uh, France doesn't have any money. So, yeah. <laughs> Victory! That's pretty much left France with uh, no options, really. Uh, they've not got an army, they've only got one territory left, so not really got any way of generating income. Um, so I send my diplomat to their remaining city and give them the option Your of majesty. becoming a vassal um, with a small threat that if they don't accept we'll attack and because they're proud frenchmen uh, they reject civil. which uh, isn't going to work out too well for them in the future but uh, this, this video is already long time. enough so i'm going to end it there and hopefully you found the video informative but most of all entertaining If you like the video, please give a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give a thumbs down. But either way, please leave me some feedback. I do appreciate it. And as always, please like and subscribe because it helps grow the channel. Thanks.